okay? Today, um, we are going to talk about something that I know none of you in terms of topic uh, have arrived yet because it relates to emotional intelligence and um, emotional intelligence is, is covered kind of at the end of the um, advanced class. And, um, and, and just to, 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 to give you a very brief sense of emotional intelligence without wasting too much time is that when you ask someone, what do you think emotional intelligence is? They usually come up with, well, probably something about my emotions and probably somebody else's emotions. And they may come up with the word empathy and, and that's it. Right. And the, the cool thing is, is that, well, we're born with our normal intelligence, our intellect, you know, we cannot change that. We can train it for it to work faster or more optimal, but we are in essence, we are, you know, whatever you're given at birth, you're stuck with it, right? And that's either good or bad news, depending on how you look at it, right? Now our EQ, our emotional intelligence, is actually something that we can learn to develop, which is really good news um, because if you focus on um, uh, uh, on, on yourself and go, Hey, what, uh, what could I learn today in order to become more emotionally intelligent? You actually start immediately influencing different things. Well, first of all, scientific evidence has shown that, um, in terms of what makes a person successful, is that emotional intelligence is actually four times more likely to give you success than intelligence does. So that's really good news, okay? Um, and the second thing is emotional intelligence, when you're very well developed in emotional intelligence, you also tend to be happier in well-being. So there's an immediate correlation with the more emotionally intelligent or how well balanced you are, the happier you're going to be. So that's, uh, that's also really good news. Now, so you can learn to develop this. Now, if you were to, let's say, do an, an emotional intelligence assessment of some sort, you actually don't want to score the maximum all over the place. And, and the reason why is let's say if you're really high on one element of emotional intelligence, then you actually want to balance it out with another element of emotional intelligence. Otherwise it just gets to be too much, right? Now the thing is that there is actually 16 elements to emotional intelligence, 16, where I just said, when you ask a random person, they just come well, something, something about emotions, you know? So learning those 16 markers in terms of what they are um, is, a, is, a, is a step number one in going for yourself like, hmm, where, where could I use some work, right? Now, the really cool thing is, is that if you want to develop your own emotional intelligence, then you can immediately start seeing like NLP is the way to get there like the practical application. So one thing that really uh, I find annoying in emotional intelligence training, that it's so definition based, like here's the definition and let's talk about it, how important it is. But they give no really real practical exercises uh, to develop it for yourself, where NLP does. So where the traditional NLP model was developed before emotional intelligence was that an emotional intelligence were like, well, we don't know what NLP is. So if you as a coach or as a person or as a leader start combining these two things, you start actually to realize that 
emotional intelligence in essence gives you a framework or a wrapper around NLP. And, and that is not surprising. And why is that not surprising? It's because NLP is about emotions. It is about thoughts. It's about engaging um, in our environment. It's about engaging with our past, present, and our future. And we are emotional beings. And we're in an environment where emotions are flying around. And, you know, and I assuming that everybody has done the very first section of the training is that, you know, I had a whole lesson on learning is an emotional process in itself, you know, and it comes with positive as well as negative emotions for an adult. I think that a, a, a child doesn't really care. You're like, well, learning is learning. You're not going to sit in a corner crying because you can't walk, you know, right away. You're fine with the trial and error until you get it. It isn't until we get older that we start judging ourselves for these things. Anyway, the 15 markers, well, 16, depending how you look at it, but the markers or the elements of emotional intelligence are, are, are grouped under, let's say, five sections, five realms. And today we're going to discover, uh, discuss one of those, which is the decision making. Now, decision making, it's, it's very interesting. Some of us are very good at making decisions for the long term, uh, but are horrible at short term decisions <laughs> uh, like impulse control. And, and some of us is the other way around. And I actually like to, 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 to hang the concept of decision maker making onto uh, some concepts of NLP. And some of them, I know some of you already have covered in learning in, in the uh, foundation class, and some of it you have not, but I, I'm, I am going to sort of make sure that I explain it in a way that it all starts to sound familiar. Okay, so that it all makes sense to you. Um, and so there are three elements in emotional intelligence that are part of decision making. And, and the first one, it's about impulse control, right? In fact, I'll, I'll give it away. <laughs> when I do emotional intelligence tests, my impulse control could use some work. <laughs> That's a, like one of my lower, my lower elements here. So impulse control is a thing. But then again, like, you know what, maybe that's a fun thing in a training room because you never know what's going to happen in my training room. Anyway, so impulse control, well, what is that? It's, it's the ability to, in a given moment, to sort of resist temptation. And, and you may have heard about the, the marshmallow experiment, okay? And, 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 and I'll give you the experiment um, because it very much relates to this, this concept of impulse control. But in the 60s, sometimes when psychologists are bored of, uh, you know, studying mentally ill people and torturing mice, they decide to torture children instead. So what they did, and it was at the University of Stanford, this is not the same as the Stanford experiment. These were little children, and they were, I think, about five or six years old, so very young children. And the kids could choose between uh, a marshmallow or a pretzel as their favorite snack. And so they, they were put in a room with a marshmallow, let's say, on a little plate, in front of them and an adult would uh, give them an instruction and they say if you um, if you if you refrain from eating this marshmallow for i think it was 10 minutes very short amount of time then i'll give you that marshmallow you can eat it and a second one right so i'm going to leave you alone in this room and and they would pay attention as to you know, what would happen to this 
poor, tortured five-year-old soul, right? And it's really when you watch the old movies of this, it's kind of funny because it's literally as if you see like a little drug addict, right? So you see these children like staring at this marshmallow and they're pulling their hair or they're kicking the table or it's really, they're in absolute agony. And um, I think it's funny to watch, maybe a little cruel, maybe this is why I don't have children. Anyway, so, so they're, they're literally in agony. And most children, two thirds of the children, in fact, they, within sometimes even seconds, they end up eating a marshmallow, right? It was only a very small amount, one third of the children that was able to sort of distract themselves or not eat it or TikTok, you know, uh, was able to, uh, to not eat the marshmallow and, uh, and get that reward. You know, the, 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 the short-term gratification was delayed to get a bigger long-term payoff, right? And so the interesting thing, what they did is that they followed up with these five-year-olds when they were in their early 20s. And they discovered really something really cool is that the children that were part of the group that could resist uh, eating a marshmallow, they turned to have you know, a better weight control issues. They had less illnesses. They were happier. They had higher GPAs, uh, more uh, like a, they, they went to, in most cases, they had a higher rate of going to college and graduating high school. And, and they just discovered all of these benefits in, in terms of being able to, to resist temptation or delay gratification, which kind of makes sense because when you think about things like goal setting, then you could easily procrastinate until the end of days eating marshmallows all day of various kinds, right? Rather than doing what you need to do. And um, now there's just recently, there's, there has been some scrutiny in terms of this particular research because it is not as clean or as scientific as it could be. And the reason why is, is that they use the children of the uh, university employees. So it wasn't in essence, uh, a cross section of society at all. I'd like to say, yeah, whatever, you know, go poo poo all over this particular uh, experiment. I'm going, why? Because I don't know if you know this, um, the vast majority of psychological research in the world, and we're talking over 90% historically of research in the world, um, has been, first of all, about stress, anxiety, mental illness, about negative emotions, right? So things like impulse control is, is not necessarily something that we're interested in, or emotional intelligence is not something that the average a psychological uh, uh, study researcher is really focused on. So that's one. The, the second thing is the majority, well, a lot, maybe not the majority, but a lot of scientific research unbeknownst to all of us who go seek therapy and or even want to quote according to research um, is that actually, um, there's someone not muted. And if you don't mind all checking. Um, so what in, in fact is the case that a lot of the psychological research um, that uh, we often end up quoting is that uh, has been done on less than uh, uh, 75 college undergraduate and many times over from the United States. Now, I don't know how much you yourself at the age that you are now have in common with college undergraduates, probably not that much, um, but that's where people do research. And that's why I think in the world of positive psychology, 
um, what the real cool thing is, is that the internet is used a lot to determine some of the topics that we've been talking about, which is kind of cool. Anyway, emotional intelligence um, uh, focuses on, uh, on many subjects, but one of them being this impulse control, this ability to delay gratification. A second element of the decision-making realm of emotional intelligence is reality testing. Now, what the heck is that? Well, when you think about a, a given situation, you know, there is the, the factual thing that's going on, and then there is your fantasy of what's going on. In essence, your map of the world. And you can almost sort of say, what's the difference or how big is the difference between uh, what's factually going on and your interpretation of what's going on, your, your map of the world. And as I think all of you've learned is that we're, we're, we're deleting and distorting and generalizing information. We're filtering out information. The majority of it, we don't even notice. And, and in that, we start to have an interpret, interpretation and our own unique map. The map is not the territory, okay? Now, the thing is, for some of us, what we think is going on is is really far removed of what's actually going on, right? And, you know, I think, I, I mean, I don't know uh, most of you in here, but I think you can kind of think of a friend who, when you are with this friend or this family member, you go, in what world is this your reality? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, like, did we even attend the same party? Did we have? Did we grow up in the same family? Um, and so this is a real different interpretation. Um, and and I think that also our own maps of reality tend to be really affected. Well, well, first of all, when we're drinking, that would be one reason where our reality <laughs> testing can be a little off. Um, I think that our reality testing can also be really off when you put like introverts in a group of people for too long of a time, they get stabby, right? Uh, or you ask extroverts to stop talking for an hour, that, that freaks them out too, right? So that can be an effect. Uh, your night's sleep can really... Uh, affect how how accurate you are in your reality testing. Um, your reality testing can be really off when you have low self-esteem. Your reality testing can be really off also when you, uh, let's say, uh, are experiencing a really heightened emotion. You know, that's a, it's another thing where, hmm, maybe I'm not as accurate as I think I am, okay? So there, and you know, for, for the women out there, you could be hormonal that, well, that's a shit show right there. Right. Um, I don't know about you, but you know, when I'm in that mode, I'm like, yeah, Nikki, don't trust your process right now. You, the other person may have a, have a point today, <laughs> uh, maybe hide inside. Um, so the reality testing, and I think it's really important to also recognize um, for yourself that is my reality testing in this moment maybe hindered somehow, you know, by my lack of sleep, by my emotion, maybe an unfamiliar uh, situation. Um, you know, I, I notice it in the, in the training room. And for those of you who, who have been in my training room, then, uh, You've seen various moments when people get tired and people are on an emotional roller coaster that reality testing can be pretty interesting to say the least, right? And I'm not gonna go into specific anecdotes, but when I see some of my former students um, in this particular group, like I see, I see Axel, I see Andrea, I see April, 
Um, and, you know, is, is when you think about it back to class, there has been in all of your classes at some point or another, an emotional reality testing chit chat, right? And, um, and then, and then the, the last element that is, is part of uh, this element of decision making, uh, and that is problem solving. And, and not just any problem solving, in emotional intelligence, the way that we, where we talk about problem solving is to think about um, solving problems in situation where there are emotions flying around. But to also then being able to in an environment where there is lots of emotions to also use emotion as a as an effective problem solving tool. Okay, so that is sort of being able to navigate in an environment where all, all kinds of emotions are in play, including your own, right? To be able to step back and go, okay, you know, what, what's going on? And I find this particularly interesting in a situation where people don't have enough information. So uh, I'll, I'll give you an, uh, an example uh, that really stands out to me is that uh, a few years ago, I don't know, where, uh, there was a Hurricane Irma. I was in Miami and I was teaching a class and the class was in a location called Sunny Isles Beach. Um, and, and when there were the, this, this hurricane business started to sort of unfold, um, it, it, th there was quickly mentioned that that area where my NLP practitioner was going on was going to be hit. Now, here's the thing. You, in Miami, you get um, hurricane warnings all the time. It's September, you know, whatever. And so, so here's a whole group of foreigners, some locals with families, elderly parents, children, uh, people who are from other places in the U.S., people who are from uh, abroad, including myself. And I guess the majority of us not necessarily, necessarily experienced where it comes to hurricanes, right? And I remember that there was like a few days of what should, what's happening in, in Florida, is this real or is this another fake call like I, like we've heard so many times before and i'm making business decisions and it's emotional because it is my students need to be safe but if i cancel am i where is everybody gonna go so you can imagine in this soup of emotions in this training room um there was this a lot of lack of information and, 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 and people needed to make both individual decisions for themselves, but they also, in some cases, needed each other to get the hell out of town, right? And I was also in it as a business owner. And I wanted to make sure that my friends in Miami, and there was one in hospital, were also going to be okay. So you can imagine in situations like that, where there is an unknown um, that this problem solving and these emotions and to be able to solve that problem, but to also keep your own emotions in check. It's a really tricky thing, right? And, and can you even imagine in this pandemic that has been going on, and I don't wanna really go into it because I think we're all sick and tired of hearing about it, but think about also how you have been in an emotional soup of your own, maybe, probably, in relation to what has been going on, whether it's for your work, for your business, for your family, um, where you constantly need to make decisions with very little in information. You know, the way that I've, I've been phrasing it, what COVID has been about for me as a business owner that I need to make 100% of the decisions based on 50% of information. It's really challenging.
right? So that's where you see this, this problem solving sort of coming at play. So impulse control, reality testing, and problem solving. So those are three, uh, three things that are part of the decision making section of emotional intelligence. Now, how can we, how can we play with NLP in this? Well, I think the first thing is that when decisions or when need to be made, I think the first thing that you, you really need to check for, because I think you get very unreliable, both in terms of impulse control, reality testing, as well as problem solving, if you don't have enough information. Right? So the first question in any decision that you make do I have the information or education or knowledge that I need? That's a very important thing because a lack of information equals anxiety and or stress. Sometimes this lack of information can be very easily solved by Googling it by asking someone and so that is sort of like hey i'm feeling a negative emotion my reality testing is off my impulse control is kind of not the best right now problem solving because impulse control goes to the path of least resistance and problem solving also not the best and hey this is an easy shoe in get the information also, when we lack information, the very creative among us, right? What we start doing is we start to make shit up. What I mean with that, we, we, we start spinning sentences in our minds that start with, what if? Yeah, and so what we do is anxiety only lives in the future. The what if anxiety. What I mean to say is, is that in the pressure, present, you put yourself into the future. What if this goes wrong? And then you associate into your future self, hallucinating as if it's already going wrong. And that is something that we're tempted to do when we lack the information that we need or we don't know how to do something. So in terms of decision-making, I would say don't make any decisions of any kind if all you need to do is to decide to gather the information first. It's, it may sound like really um, common sense, right? Because often in business situations, you're like, well, I don't know what to decide. I need to do due diligence first, right? Then we know. But in personal situations or in, in the moment, we, we try to force ourselves to make decisions where we really can't because we don't have the information. And ironically, we, we often start spinning this for hours and 10 times over that the time that it would have taken to Google it or to make that phone call is much shorter amount of time than, than actually the, 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 the brain space that it ends up occupying, right? So it's a lack of information. So satisfy that need first, yeah? And also recognize in your own mind when you start using what if. I mean, I can flip that around. What if it's going to be amazing, you know, or instead of what if it's going to go wrong, okay? So that's the first thing. The second thing that is really important is the, to think about, well, could this be about a need that I have? So you could have a physical need. A physical need is you find it really hard to make a good decision or lack of impulse control or lack of reality testing or lack of problem solving skills because you're not satisfying the physical need. 
It can be anything. That can be water, that can be food, that can be uh, having to use the restroom, can be sex, can be whatever. A physical need. Now, your reality testing and your impulse control and your problem solving skills go out of the door the further your body is off balance. You're not the best decision maker, right? So you need to make sure that your body travels back to balance or you need to start distrusting your ability to make good decisions in those moments. Especially like for instance, I'm a little hypoglycemic. So if I don't eat and I'm in a training room, especially on Bali and it gets hot, I start to really get angry. I start to get emotions that are almost not mine and they caused by my blood sugar. So it's, it's, it's handy to sort of know about that, know that about yourself. You could also have an emotional need that isn't met, right? So that's a, that's a thing that you need to examine. So you could go, well, what specifically, metamodel question, am I feeling, right? And how specifically, also a metamodel question, do I satisfy that need, right? You could also sort of tap into how high is this emotion? Like when we have this very big emotion, and especially if that emotion is either negative or positive, actually, we can make some really poor decisions because we're experiencing a heightened negative emotion Right, but we can also make really poor decisions when we experience a heightened positive emotions. You know, those are like situation where you go to these seminars, you know, you're know, like you're tired and you go three days of woohoo, and you're like happier than you've ever been. The music is playing, you know. I got a feeling that the night is gonna be a good night, blah blah blah, right. And then they say, hey, do you want to buy the $25,000 seminar that takes place all over the world? And you're like, here's my card, right? And you're not thinking about what does it cost to fly? What does it cost to, for a hotel? And then, then you're like, well, okay, well, what if I can't afford it? They're like, no problem, because the last seminar, we're going to teach you how to be a millionaire. So we got you covered, right? <laughs> and, and that's sort of like, ooh, really scary. So here's my word of advice. When you're experiencing either negative or positive, a heightened emotion, question your ability to reality test, to problem solve, and, and to have impulse control. Just wait, because emotions, as you may have learned in anchoring if you're there already, is that in state elicitation, emotions ramp up and then they taper off again. So sometimes delaying decision-making by 15 minutes can allow that emotion to taper off, right? That's a thing that you wanna do because you can like, how specifically am I feeling? What specifically am I feeling? If I had to rate the intensity between one and 10, how high is it? Am I better off to wait? hold off, right? I don't like making decisions, big ones that require my signature on a contract, when I'm tired, when I'm in emotional state. Like a business uh, thing that I have, whether it is the people that are working within my company, I work with a lot of consultants, and my students, when someone approaches you, me, hey, Nikki, do you want to commit to this thing with me? And I know I'm in a heightened emotional state or I'm tired or I'm in a training room. I'm like, can I get back to you on that? Because I want to go home, introvert on it, sleep. You know, I want to process this without the pressure of that environment. So that's a, I used to not do that. And, and I would say yes to things that I really shouldn't. Right. So so that's it. What's an emotional need? Should that need be satisfied? So meta-model that. 
And for those of you who haven't covered the meta model yet, the meta model is about making the unconscious conscious. And so the easiest way to is just to focus on three questions. What, who, and how specifically? And so you're like, what specifically am I feeling? How specifically is this emotion displaying itself? What specifically is a need that I need to fulfill before I make a decision of any kind? Okay. Then what can be pretty interesting in decision making is something that is called the positive intent. And the positive intent in foundation, it's part of the presuppositions of NLP. There is a positive intent motivating every behavior, okay? When you go into the advanced uh, class, you'll learn how to discover what a positive intent, uh, how you elicit that, how you figure that out. Now, to make it very simple for you right now, I want you to think about um, a decision that you need to make, right? It doesn't have to be like Indiana Jones, like huge. Um, I'm not asking you to choose between your two children or something like that, or your twins, Andrea, for you. Um, something simple, you know, a decision. And I want you to imagine for a second that that part of decision A, right? But you can imagine that part that wants to make decision A is sitting right in front of you, whatever desk you're at. And I want you to imagine that that part of you that wants to make decision A looks like something. What would it look like? Right? If I were to touch this part outside of you that's going to make decision A, does it feel like anything? Like, does it have a texture? Or um, does it have a temperature? Is it small or is it large? And does that part of you make a sound? So now this part of you that's gonna make decision A is sitting right in front of you. And I want you to ask it a question in your mind. Otherwise you sound like a crazy person talking to space. I want you to ask it a question. And I want you to ask it, what is the positive value or the positive intent that you're trying to meet if I decide for you? If that's crazy days for you, then I want you to do it differently. You can also discover the positive intent in this way. I want you to ask your intuition this question, your internal gut, your internal knowing. This is not a logical answer. This is not thinking about it. I'm not interested in that. The answer will come to you like a sense, a feeling, maybe an image of some kind. And I want you to attach a positive word to it. What's the positive intent that motivates this decision? Okay, so then hopefully you have an answer. If you don't have an answer, logically think about it. What do you get out of it? In one word, one positive value. Decision B, yeah, the other side of the decision. What's the positive intent there? Maybe the same, maybe not. We're very tempted to have a need to have values met like safety, security, and protection. It's like, uh, otherwise we get negative emotions. We don't have those. But anyway, discovering the positive intent sometimes helps us to understand the why behind these decisions. So that can be helpful. Now, another thing that you can do is future pace it. And I'm gonna do this the Buddhist way. 
And future pacing and NLP is placing your mind into the future and then associate to see, hear, and feel. So I want you to imagine for a moment a decision on, a, well, just use the decision that you've thought about earlier. If you made decision A, what will you, right now, what will you see, hear, and feel an hour from now? What will you see here feel a day from now? A week from now? Three months from now? Is this going to be relevant at the end of your life somehow? Like, if you're stuck on decisions, then only make it about those ones that are going to have an impulse a year from now, right? Then on decision B, do the same thing. Step into your future self an hour from now, if you chose decision B. What would you see here and feel? What if you stepped into yourself of tomorrow, a month from now, three months from now, a year from now, end of your life? Sometimes this is very clarifying. I can tell you that people that make awesome decisions in restaurants to order the healthy meal, what they do is they think about how they will feel an hour after consuming this meal. Some people even go, if I eat that other meal, the shitty meal, then three months from now, and I keep doing that, I'm gonna look like that. So they, they future pace themselves either in a negative or in a positive to make a good food decision. Where someone who doesn't have any impulse control or less of it will go, oh my God, macaroni and cheese. I love macaroni and cheese. I must have it. Right? So I have to go sit there like, oh, I have to NLP myself out of that. Right? And because I have a positive intent that's behind my eating things, I think eating is fun. And eating is about freedom. So you see how this all this, this decision thing can be sort of all over the place when you think about the pyramid. Yeah, the environment is at the bottom, then you have behaviors, and then you have you know skills and values that and the identity and then source that it can decisions can be sort of like being really intertwined and, and sort of messy in there. But future pacing really can help making a decision. You know, but you also need to reality test that. Sometimes I find that some people are very prone for their future pacing to be void of reality testing. And what I mean with that is they're like, oh, it's gonna be amazing. And I'm like, and it's never gonna happen, right? Or their future pacing is negative. It's all doom and gloom. You may as well stay in bed forever, right? And not try to meet any of your goals. So that, that's something to check. Now, how do you check that then? Most of you should know that answer. Association, dissociation is a great way to check it. So you think about the first perceptual position, right? That's often sort of like, okay, if you step into the decision A or B that you had earlier, what do you learn if you step into your own first perceptual position? Well, that's what you just did anyway, because I future paced you, right? That was a first perceptual position concept. I also asked you what's your positive intent. Also first perceptual position. What's your emotional need? Also first perceptual position. 
Now, what happens if you float your mind out of your own body right now? And you look at yourself and there is no emotion. That person over there may as well be a complete stranger who needs to make this decision. You could imagine that it's a coaching client and, and you are now an observer, you're neutral, and you have to coach that person over there in decision A or decision B. What is it that you learn? See, the reality testing is much easier from here because you get less stuck in your own shit. The impulse control, see the temptation is much less there from third perceptual position. And problem solving can also be sometimes easier if you're not experiencing all of the emotions. You have the ability to step out. When you think about it, right? Now also here you can future pace. So third perceptual position is amazing, especially for reality testing. What's really going on? And by the way, if you know that your reality testing is a little off, sometimes it helps to consult someone else who you do know is very good at reality testing, who is like one step removed. And so sometimes when I'm, I'm in at my place of work and I'm experiencing emotions, then sometimes it can be really helpful for me to consult whoever is assisting me or co-training with me. Because I don't trust myself in my, let's say, let's say my emotions are somehow hurt and they do sometimes get hurt at work even though people may not be able to tell. Um, but I like to, 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 to reality test that sometimes with someone else because I know I'm not trusting my own judgment here. Sometimes it also helps to just go for a walk, move, dissociate. Your emotion can then taper off, make much better decisions. We just sleep or stop drinking, <laughs> you know? So that's a, a way to look at it. Now, sometimes decisions can impact others. So if it was relevant for that A or B decision that we talked about earlier, what if you stepped into the shoes of a person who could be impacted by your decision? What would this person see, hear, or feel if you made decision A? What would this person see, hear, or feel if you make decision B? So that's another clue. So those are all kinds of little NLP foundation and only one NLP advance because that was the positive intent that you can sort of launch a better decision making for yourself, but also when you sit down with a client. And then we haven't even begun to think of a decision in relation to the life wheel. And the decision in relation to PERMA.
see how this this decision making thing how that should be be part of emotional intelligence because it all falls or stands with how what our relationship what our relationship is and the understanding of our own emotions and that of other people you know to also know our own traps in decision making If you want to look at an interesting concept and skip ahead, you know, you can skip ahead for one video. But in the, in the advanced class, there is a, uh, a pattern called the parts integration. And it's in the section that talks about parts work. Yeah, so the section parts work and the video, or the lesson is the demonstration of the parts integration. And that is with coach Tina. And coach Tina had to make a decision. Do I go left or right? And, and then you see me performer technique using positive intents, which is kind of like, huh, that's almost like unconsciously having to integrate. You could skip ahead and watch that if you want. Because then you see how sometimes we are unable to make decisions because it involves our unconscious mind is not collaborating. When you think about the pyramid, it's too high up in the pyramid. So we get stuck. I want both, right? And if I don't have both, it's gonna make me unhappy, right? So that's a, that's a way to think about it. I think a good thing to adopt for yourself in general is to always tap into what am I feeling? And then, because this is a lot in a moment, right? But if you can at least detect what you're feeling and the intensity of your feeling, then you at least can tell that you should delay your decision. Right? Because sometimes these really big decisions are harmed because we're not willing to wait 15 minutes. Even small decisions. You know, I mentioned macaroni and cheese earlier. Most of the time when I go, mm, macaroni and cheese, and I go, Nikki, distract yourself for 15 minutes, I completely forget about it. Or there is like, hey, it's not in line with my goals. I already had macaroni and cheese yesterday and the day before. And the baby, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know what I'm saying? And I think it's also really good to ask yourself the question, how good am I at reality testing? We've had some discussions about uh, people being unable, uh, Nicola, for instance, gonna throw you under the bus, uh, having a hard time stepping out of the second perceptual position, right? So think about your decision-making, how that can really get screwed up because of not being in first or third. Does that make sense? Because you're always decision-making for the impact on someone else. And that's a good thing if it's your child who needs food, but, but what if it's something that is really you know, to satisfy your own needs, you know? And I think that that's a, a, a really a good thing and, and, and the ability to consult experts, you know, to, to, to really have a good critical look, be willing to step out of that room. So that's sort of a little bit on, um, on decision-making, impulse control, reality testing and problem solving. And I gave you a whole lot of information, but what I really wanted to drive home 
is two things, right? Two things. One is how big the scope of emotional intelligence is, right? And two, how NLP techniques or even designs can facilitate the development of emotional intelligence which is why it surprises me that it's not taught in all NLP trainings. I don't even understand how you can get around it. <laughs>